All right, we're back in another Sound of Battle Cry. And the name of the message today is How to Respond to a Devastating Loss, Wisdom from the House of Mourning. Who is this message for? Well, it could be for an individual, it could be for, for a family, um, and also to help people, maybe if you know someone else who's experienced a loss, that for to uh, give you the tools to help other people. Um, and, you know, the message is about... If someone has a devastating loss, meaning they lose a loved one, could be even something else, maybe, you know, your house burns down, something crazy happens, something awful, maybe even a massive betrayal, you know, someone stabs you in the back really bad, you thought you trusted, or, you know, anything like that. Just something really bad happens. Um, I think it's important to have a message just based on that, just focused on that to, to show from the Bible how you should respond to those things, uh, the biblical way. Because, you know, there's always a lot of bad advice out there, on, really on every subject, but this subject as well. So I want to look at some examples and some principles from the Bible to help anyone out there that has experienced something like this or maybe will. And also, like I said, so that you could help other people maybe that are going through some tough times, uh, give you some biblical advice to, um, to help others. And uh, that's pretty much it, so let's get right into it. So the first thing we're going to look at is the devastating loss that David and his men suffered while they were away from home. Okay, so they've been fighting some battles and... Um, Previously, David had attacked the Amalekites, and uh, what happened was they were away from their home, which was at Ziklag, and they had all their stuff there. They had their families, their wives, and their children there, and they came back to a devastating scene, and I think this is a great example, the perfect example of an absolutely devastating awful thing that happened and that they experienced and we're going to see we're going to get a lot out of seeing what happened and the response to it there's a lot of lessons so uh, we'll read that first and this is from first samuel chapter 30 starting at verse 1 which says this and it came to pass when david and his men were come to ziklag on the third day that the Amalekites had invaded the south and Ziklag and smitten Ziklag and burned it with fire. Okay, so that was their home. They burned it with fire. And had taken the women captives that were therein. They slew not any, either great or small, but carried them away and went on their way. So David and his men came to the city, and behold, it was burned with fire, and their wives and their sons and their daughters were taken captives. Then David and the people that were with him lifted up their voice and wept until they had no more power to weep. And David's two wives were taken captives, Ahinoam the Jezreelitess and Abigail the wife of Nabal the Carmelite. And David was greatly distressed for the people spake of stoning him because the soul of all the people was grieved every man for his sons and for his daughters. But David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. And David said to Abiathar the priest, Ahimelech's son, I pray thee, bring me hither the ephod. And Abiathar brought thither the ephod to David, and David inquired at the Lord, saying, Shall I pursue after this troop? Shall I overtake them? And he answered him, Pursue, for thou surely Thou shalt surely overtake them and without fail recover all. Okay. So, David and his men come back to see the city destroyed by fire. Their families kidnapped. It was an absolutely terrible sight to come home to. They were overwhelmed with grief. Okay, so try to imagine the situation. They come home. Everything's burned. And everyone's kidnapped. Imagine that. Imagine you come home and your house is burnt down. And they also kidnapped your wife and children. Be pretty devastating. You would be filled with grief. 
and you wouldn't know what to do. You'd be angry, you'd be sad, confused, shocked. Be quite the situation. Now imagine if it happened to an entire town, an entire army. So that was a, you know, absolutely devastating scene to come back to. So David knew it. And his men knew a thing or two about experiencing devastating loss, experiencing this grief in this morning. Um, many people throughout history have experienced grieving, you know, situations, grievous situations. And so that's that's one thing to think about right off the bat. Is sometimes it feels like if you go through something really devastating that you're the only one, but. The truth is, many people have. And so, that's why it's good for us to look to other examples of people that have been through those situations themselves to figure out how to best deal with this situation, especially looking in the Bible. So, they they went through this situation. It was a terrible sight to come home to. And we can take a number of lessons from this situation, especially when we contrast the reaction of David to the other men, because there was a different reaction we can see right off the bat. And we're going to look at that. David and his men, they all were devastated. They were all filled with grief, but then there was a split in the reaction and the men started to turn on David. And so that's an important thing that we need to take some lessons from because what we're going to do for the rest of the teaching is basically go back and forth contrasting the right and wrong attitudes. And so I'll say, you know, it is good for us to do this. It's not good for us to do this. It's good for us to do this. It's good for us to do that. And keep going back and forth contrasting the good attitude and the bad attitude so that we can take all the lessons from, to have a balanced perspective in getting these lessons. Okay. And also, before I get into this too, um, you might wonder if I've gone through devastating loss myself. Yes, I have, more than once. I've absolutely. And so, I'm not a stranger to going through things like this myself, personally. So, I do speak from experience as well. Okay. First lesson is, it is normal and healthy to mourn for a time. Even tough men of war wept. It says right there, 1 Samuel chapter 30, verse 4, Then David and the people that were with him lifted up their voice and wept until they had no more power to weep. Okay, so these were very tough soldiers. This is long before the time of drones and guns even, all the way back fighting with swords and shields. And it said that David had slayed his tens of thousands, very battle-hardened men, and yet they wept. And it says they wept until they had no more power to weep. So, especially when it comes to men, it is not, you are not cool, you are not supposedly alpha male if you think you should never weep, you should never cry. That's absolutely false. And you are completely going against everything natural when you experience a devastating loss and you try to, pre- to prevent yourself from uh, crying and mourning over the situation. That's not natural. That's not normal. It is, nor- it is normal and healthy for everyone. But I, I wanted to make sure we focus on the men as well because they have more resistance against that. And... Another example is Nehemiah mourned when he heard the news of devastating loss as well. Nehemiah chapter 1 verse 3. And they said unto me, The remnant that are left of the captivity there in the province are in great affliction and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem also is broken down, and the gates thereof are burned with fire. And it came to pass when I heard these words that I sat down and wept and mourned certain days and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. Okay, so Nehemiah did the same thing. He heard the bad news, heard the devastation, what had happened to Jerusalem. He sat down, he wept, and he mourned. He had a time of mourning because it's normal. And of course, Jesus Christ did as well. 
And we see that in John chapter 11, when Mary and Martha's brother died. It says in John chapter 11, verse 32, Then when Mary was come where Jesus was and saw him, she fell down at his feet, saying unto him, Lord, if thou hadst been here, my brother had not died. When Jesus therefore saw her weeping, and the Jews also weeping which came with her, he groaned in the spirit and was troubled, and said, Where have you laid him? They said unto him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. Then said the Jews, Behold how he loved him. Even Jesus wept. Okay? So unless you think you're, you're a man and you're better than Jesus, it's okay to weep. It's okay to have a time of mourning. It's normal. And you need to just let it happen. And you have that time. Don't try to fight it. If you try to suppress it, you know, on one level, yeah, you, you, you do need to keep it together a little bit. If you're a man with a family, you got to take care of people at a certain level. But make sure you take time for mourning. You can't completely stuff it and make it go away. Take some time for yourself as well to mourn. That's important. And it's healthy and it's good. It's normal. And on the other side of that, but it is not good to let the morning turn to despair, okay? So like I said, we're going to go back and forth to make sure that we're balanced. We don't get out of whack. We don't go to extremes. So it's normal and healthy to mourn for a time, but it is not good to let the morning turn to despair. Sorrow of the world that worketh death. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 8 says, We are perplexed, but not in despair. Not turning to despair, giving into despair. If you have hope in your present circumstances, if you have your hope in your present circumstances, material things, or anything else in this world besides God, you will turn to despair after losses. That's what's going to happen. Let's look at this. Um, this verse, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that she sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. Okay, so that's an important verse. You know, because it's talking about people that have died, and it's talking about the resurrection, right? But it's talking about the fact that you know that there is, if you know that there is a world beyond this physical world, beyond this material world, then you will not give it to despair and have no hope. It says here that you sorrow not even as others which have no hope. Those that don't know that there is a world beyond this world. And they those that don't have hope that they will be in heaven for all of eternity. That they have the gift of eternal life. If they don't have that, then they don't have hope. And so when they lose things in this world, it can bring them to despair. They lose material things, circumstances, maybe it could be an absolute destruction of a career, maybe. Their job. Who knows? Life doesn't go their way and all of a sudden they're giving into despair. Because all of their hope is wrapped up in this life and nothing else. And so that is the grounds and the foundation of of having hope and not giving into despair, preventing despair, is making sure that you do not have your hope wrapped up in the circumstances of this life. And even in this situation, let's say someone, you lost someone, right? Maybe someone died. Well, like I said, it's normal and healthy to mourn, but it shouldn't last forever. And it shouldn't you shouldn't give in to despair because you know that one day, if you're saved, if, if you're born again, that you will be in heaven where there will be no more death, no more sorrow, no more crying, no more pain ever again. And so you have hope and you look forward to that day. And you know that this life is just temporary. The suffering is just temporary. The pain is just temporary. And when you have that, that's an anchor for you 
to prevent you from drifting off into a, a, a black sea of despair. So that's very important. Let's go to the next point. It is important to look to God for lessons you can learn from this experience. Yes. Okay. You should be open to the fact that in a time of loss, time of pain, is actually an opportunity to learn lessons. A lot of times people do not learn lessons when it's a time of celebration, a time of festivities, not really learning a whole lot. But there is a whole lot of learning that should be going on in a time of pain and mourning. First lesson to David should not have left Ziklag unprotected. He should have, he should have left some soldiers behind to protect the city, but he didn't. And he suffered because of that. So there's always something you can look at and 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 not don't beat yourself up. Hindsight is 2020, right? I don't mean going back and trying to nitpick every little thing and, and guilt trip yourself. You want to avoid that. But you shouldn't be proud either and not try to examine things. It's always good to do some self-examination during a trial. Examine yourself and also think about any lessons or important reminders to take away from the situation. Let's look at some verses. 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5. Examine yourselves whether ye be in the faith, prove your own selves. Know ye not your own selves how that Jesus Christ is in you, except ye be reprobates. Now I put that first because that actually is something that you should do as well. If something happens, especially when we're talking about something like death, but it could be after any time of loss, you should make sure you're saved. There's nothing wrong with that. It, it, it should make you think about eternity. Death, especially, always should make us think of eternity and how short life is, really. The Bible says life is but a vapor. It's very short. And the older you get, the faster it goes. And sadly, when older people try to tell younger people that, they don't listen. But it's true. It is very true. It goes faster and faster. And before you knew it, before you know it, you're old and life is almost over. And so the time to examine yourself is not tomorrow, it's now. Especially after a time of loss. Make sure you examine yourself to make sure that you're saved. It's the most important thing. That you, that there is a time that you know that you have repented of a life of sin and rebellion against God and put your faith in Jesus Christ and that you know that he died for your sins, that he took the, your sin and the punishment that you deserve and he rose again from the dead, that you know that you put your faith in him, you asked him to save you, to forgive you and that you were transformed. You were made into a new creature. You were born again. You know that that has happened and that you presently have the gift of eternal life. You know that you're saved. You know where you're going when you die. Make sure that you know that. So that's um, when it says examine yourselves, that would be a good time to, to make sure that's all set. But also you can examine yourself in other ways. The Bible says 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 31, for if, if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. It also may be a good time. Let's say you may, you say, well, I, I'm saved. I know I'm saved. I know I'm born again. Okay, great. Maybe you could examine other things. It says if we would judge ourselves, examine yourself, judge yourself. To say, hey, maybe you've been letting things slip. Maybe you, back, maybe you backslid a little bit. Maybe there's some things you've been neglecting. Maybe you've been going astray a little bit. Maybe there's some sin you need to repent of, some bad habits, some attitudes. Maybe you need to humble yourself. You've had some pride. Maybe you gave into some anger or something. You need to repent of that. Whatever it is, it's a good time to examine those things because it's a, it's a time of sobriety after loss. It's a time of sobriety where you should take your life seriously. 
and your relationship with God seriously in the things of eternity. The Bible says the heart of the wise is in the house of mourning. This is because you gain wisdom in times of mourning if your heart is right with God. The house of mourning is a teacher. Okay, so let's read a passage that talks all about that in Ecclesiastes chapter 7. And then we'll move on to the next point. Ecclesiastes chapter 7 verse 2. It is better to go to the house of mourning than to go to the house of feasting. For that is the end of all men, and the living will lay it to his heart. Sorrow is better than laughter, for by the sadness of the countenance the heart is made better. The heart of the wise is in the house of mourning, but the heart of fools is in the house of mirth. It is better to hear the rebuke of the wise than for a man to hear the song of fools. For as the cackling, the crackling of thorns under a pot, so is the laughter of the fool. This also is vanity. The crackling of the thorns under the pot means that you know it burns really good, but it's fast and then it's gone. Same thing with the laughter of the fool. It's vanity. It's just there. Oh, it's really quick. It's temporary. Oh, it's funny. And then it's gone. Okay, so this shows the house of mourning is a teacher. It says, by the sadness of the, uh, of the countenance of the heart, I'm sorry, by the sadness of the countenance, the heart is made better. The heart of the wise in the, is in the house of mourning. There is lesson, There are lessons to be learned. In the house of mourning. Instead of the house of, of mirth and feasting and celebration and, and all these other types of things. And so the point is, you know, that is a time to learn. And you can gain a lot of wisdom in a time of mourning, a time of loss. It's supposed to be a time of, of sober reflection on your life. So don't try to waste it. Don't try to rush along and, and move past it and forget it. Like I said, you don't want to stay there forever and don't turn to despair. But make sure there is a time of learning and examination. Take, take the time to, to learn, to gain wisdom from the experience and lessons in life. Because you do not want to be as the fools. The heart of the fools is in the house of mirth. They don't care. The lost people in this world, all they want to do is party. They don't want to think about things of eternity. They just want to think about things of this life. Let's get drunk and forget about it. Eat, drink, and for tomorrow we shall die. We don't care. Don't care what's going to happen in the future. I just want to have fun now. It's all about pleasing themselves. Lovers of pleasure is more than lovers of God. Well, we just want to have fun. We just want to be happy. And it's all about them. Not caring about God. Not caring about spiritual things. And so, you should be different than that. Okay, so make sure it's a time to learn. It is not good to look for someone to blame. And that's what happened with David and, and his men. David's men began to blame him and even talked about killing him because they gave into their emotions. Let's look. 1 Samuel 30, verse 6 says, And David was greatly distressed, for the people spake of stoning him, because the soul of all the people was grieved, every man for his sons and for his daughters. Okay? So, they, David's men were really upset. Obviously, everyone was upset. David was upset. He had experienced loss as well. He lost his wives, right? But they turned on him. They turned on him, and they got mad at him. They wanted to blame him, wanted to. They were talking about, oh, we should stone him. And sadly, this happens um, now. Sometimes when bad things happen, people fight with each other and a lot of times look to blame someone. Something bad happens. They're looking for someone to blame. 
It's got to be someone's fault. They want to direct their anger and their pain at someone. And that's the wrong thing to do. It's absolutely wrong. And if you are the one that's looking for someone to blame after something, after a devastating loss, then you are in the wrong. And you need to repent of that. You're just causing problems. You're causing, you're adding to the pain. You're making things worse. Okay? It's not, now's not the time to look for someone to blame. Now, maybe there was someone to blame for something, but you should wait. Okay? If everyone is mourning in a time of grief, then no one should be talking about blaming someone. You just need to wait and deal with the pain and mourning at that time. But looking for someone to blame, it usually results in something, uh, bad things happening, giving into the flesh. Now, the same thing happened to Moses. Exodus chapter 17, verse 2. Wherefore, the people did chide with Moses and said, Give us water that we may drink. And Moses said unto them, Why chide ye with me? Wherefore do ye tempt the Lord? Why are you tempting God? And the people thirsted there for water, and the people murmured against Moses and said, Wherefore is this that thou hast brought us up out of Egypt, to kill us and our children and our cattle with thirst? And Moses cried unto the Lord, saying, What shall I do unto this people? They be almost ready to stone me. So again, these people were in a tough situation. They didn't have water. And what do they do? Look for someone to blame. And they blame Moses, the leader. They blame him. It's your it's all your fault. They're murmuring and complaining because of their circumstances. And they're looking at them circum their circumstances and complaining and blaming instead of looking to God for a solution and trusting God, having faith in God. Instead, it says they were tempting God. So when you go through tough circumstances and you're looking and you start complaining and looking for someone to blame, I'm here to tell you your heart's not in the right place. That's a fact. The people didn't examine themselves or try to think of lessons to be learned. They just looked for someone to take their anger out on instead of looking to God in faith. That's exactly what happened. Bible says in Ephesians 4, 26, Be ye angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath, neither give place to the devil. Okay, so sometimes there is a time for anger. There is absolutely a time for anger, righteous indignation, but it should not stay there. It should not rest in your bosom. It's supposed to pass through you. And also, it shouldn't lead you, it says be angry and sin not, it should not lead you to sin. And to do something like they were doing, which was blaming, like they did to David, blame him for this situation. They let their anger cause them to sin, to want to kill him. Here's another one, Ecclesiastes 7, 9. Be not hasty in thy spirit to be angry, for anger resteth in the bosom of fools. Okay, that's a very important point. Be not hasty, don't be quick to be angry. Every little thing happens and you get angry, get angry, get angry, get angry all the time. It's because it's resting in your bosom and you need to repent of that. And so that's important. Those verses are important to remember when it comes to the time when something bad happens or a devastating loss or bad circumstance. Shouldn't be hasty to be angry don't let the emotions take hold of you and drive you to do something bad, blaming other people, complaining against God, being bitter against God. All that is flesh. And your heart's not right if that's what's happening. Next point. It is important to remember the promises of God and, and encourage yourself with them. Okay, This is a very important point to remember in this whole thing. It is important to remember the promises of God and encourage yourself with them. 1 Samuel chapter 30, verse 6. It says, But David 
encouraged himself in the Lord, his God. Okay? David encouraged himself in the Lord, his God. Now, this is crazy because it seems hard to fathom how David could encourage himself after such a devastating loss and in the midst of all the people so angry that they wanted to kill him. He was surrounded by discouraging circumstances, yet he still encouraged himself in the Lord. It's amazing. Can't, can't believe that he could do that, that he would do that. But that's what happened. And we're going to talk a little bit about why. But first, we need to acknowledge that that's what happened. To acknowledge the circumstances around him. Very unlikely circumstances that anyone would be encouraged or could be encouraged. This awful thing just happened. Everybody's upset. And yet David turns it around. And also in the face of everyone else is doing something, has the wrong attitude. And one man in the midst of all them has the right attitude. It's an important lesson to take from that as well. You don't need to, to follow what everyone else is doing. Now, how did he do it? How? Because of faith. That's what it boils down to. Now, I'm going to expand on that. But it boils down to faith. Okay? Think about a similar circumstance when David was younger. All the armies, Saul, the king, and all the armies of Israel, they were all discouraged. They were all afraid of fighting Goliath. Goliath was going down and challenging them every day. No one wanted to fight him. Like, ah, oh, we can't do it. No one can do it. But David comes along and says, is there not a cause? What are you guys doing? How come you won't go fight him? Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? He was upset. But it said it, it was because he had faith in God. He said the battle is the Lord's. Faith, again, was underlying the whole thing that was motivating him. He didn't look to all the other men and what they were doing, even to what the king was doing. He didn't, he didn't let that discourage him. And he didn't let that stamp out his faith. His faith overcame all that and then led him to kill Goliath and win. And which inspired everyone else to go fight after that, the armies of Israel. The faith was contagious. But it all boils down to faith. So because of David's faith, again, it led him to encourage himself in the Lord in this circumstance as well. Anything is possible through faith. Let's read a passage from Matthew chapter 17. And Jesus rebuked the devil and he departed out. Uh, sorry, Matthew 17, 18. Jesus rebuked the devil and depart, and he departed out of him. And then the child was cured from that very hour. Then came the disciples to Jesus apart and said, Why could not we cast him out? And Jesus said unto them, Because of your unbelief. For verily I say unto you, if ye have faith as a grain of mustard seed, ye shall say unto this mountain, Remove hence to yonder place, and it shall remove, and nothing shall be impossible unto you. Say that again. Nothing shall be impossible unto you. Howbeit this kind goeth not out but by prayer and fasting. Okay? This spe specific type of devil that was in that person. But regardless, of that, we talk about Jesus says, you couldn't do it because of your unbelief. Instead, you should have faith. And if you have faith, nothing shall be impossible unto you. Including encouraging yourself in the face of devastating loss and everybody around you being upset, everybody around you being discouraged, everyone being sad, people giving into despair. People having the wrong attitude. People, everyone around you doing the wrong thing. Instead of being, feeling bad for yourself, pity. Oh, woe is me. I'm all alone and no one else is doing the right thing. And no one else has a good attitude. And it's so discouraging. And on and on and on. And you throw a pity party for yourself. Instead of doing that, encourage yourself in the Lord as David did. How? By faith. Faith. 
Speaking of fasting, it is a good time to fast after a devastating loss. Also, yeah, and you see that as well. As you read earlier, Nehemiah, it said after he heard the bad news, he was mourning, but it also said he wept and he mourned and he fasted. Okay, so fasting in a time of loss is, is also a thing that helps. Um, helps you to have better, you know, closer prayer with God, to denies the flesh. It's, uh, it's appropriate for the time of mourning. Now, back to faith. Okay, we're going to focus on faith because this is really, really important. Look at what it says about faith in Hebrews chapter 11. David's name is included in this list. Let's read this. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 32. And what shall I more say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and of Barak and of Samson, of Jephthah, and of David also, of David, of Samuel, of the prophets, who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, Right? It was not a time of weakness after a devastating loss or maybe the time that you're in right now. You're in a time of weakness, in a time of discouragement. Well, it says through faith, out of weakness were made strong, waxed valiant in fight, turned to fight the armies of the aliens. Women received their dead raised to life again. And others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. And others had trial of cruel mockings and scourgings. Yea, moreover, of bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn asunder, were tempted, were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. And these all, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise God having provided some better thing for us, that they without us should not be made perfect. Okay, so they did all these things through faith. That's the point. It boils down to faith. Anything that you want to do, that you need to do, that is good in the face of adversity, is through faith. But I want you to notice that not only was it, you know, they quenched the violence of fire and stopped the mouths of my, um, lions by faith, or out of weakness were made strong by faith, but also that by faith they were able to endure torture, mocking, scourging, prison, wandering around in deserts and caves. They endured all that by faith. Okay? That's an important point to remember. That you can endure really negative circumstances by faith. Devastating loss, death, loss of, of different things that you have, circumstances that change that are bad in your life. Anything that happens in this world that's negative, you can endure it by faith. Just as they did. Same God, same scriptures. They didn't have supernatural powers. They're not superheroes. They're human beings just like us. And they simply did it by faith. That's it. How do you strengthen your faith? Romans 10, 17 says, So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. You're not going to strengthen your faith unless you're reading the Word of God. Read, study, memorize the Word of God. How can you encourage yourself with the promises of God when you don't even know them? Have you even read the Bible from cover to cover at least one time? If not, you better get on that. You should be reading the Bible every day. You should be not only reading it in a daily schedule, you should be studying it. Do word studies, what, what, you know, different types of studies. You should be memorizing scripture so that you know the promises of God by heart. So then when you go to the time of pain, devastation, loss, you can turn to the promises of God to encourage yourself in the Lord as David did. 
through faith. Because faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Faith comes from the word of God. Reading it, studying it, memorizing it. Meditate thereon all the day and night. Think about the word of God. And you will have faith. You can strengthen your faith. That's very important. Also, you can ask God. The apostles did. Luke 17, 5. And the apostles said unto the Lord, Increase our faith. They asked Christ, Increase our faith. You can pray to God the same thing. You can ask God, Please God, increase my faith. Now, don't ask God to do that if you're not reading the Bible. That's foolish. But if you are already reading it, you can also ask that. But don't be surprised when you ask God to increase your faith that he also sends a trial your way. Also understand that faith grows through trials, not from a life of comfort where nothing bad ever happens. That's just not how it works. You don't sit on your couch and say, God, please increase my faith. And then magically you're sitting there and go, wow, now my faith is strengthened. No, that's not how it happens ever. And it never will. It comes from trials. Let's read. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 6. Wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations, that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. Okay? The trial of your faith, tried with fire. Fiery trials come to purify, to strengthen your faith. Job said when he, he went through a lot of trials, right? Job lost everything. All material possessions. All of his children. And he said, He knows the way that I take. When he hath tried me, I shall come forth as gold. When I'm done with this trial, he's going to burn off all the dross, all the chaff, and I will come forth as gold with a stronger faith than ever more stronger than ever before and so you can't avoid the trials when it comes to strengthening faith so don't be surprised when that comes when you ask for God to increase your faith but also understand that that's a good thing once you get through it you come out on the other side with strength and faith and now you have a stronger faith going throughout life. And also you're able to encourage others as well. Which is very important. Okay? So, how is it David able to encourage himself in the Lord? Well, it's because of faith. And we see exactly what you need to do to increase your faith. Read, study, memorize the Word of God. Ask God to strengthen your faith. And be prepared to go through trials. Endure them with patience. With, faith, with trusting God that he's, it's for your good, for your benefit. It's not going to last forever. And when you come out the other side, you'll have a stronger faith. Okay? Next point. It is not good to focus on the present circumstances. Walking by sight instead of walking by faith. Okay? So... This is a temptation that when something bad happens, a devastating loss, you can get caught up on focusing only on the present circumstance. And you're only thinking about this bad thing that happened and your present circumstances. You lost the, the, the person that passed away or the thing that you lost. Could be a house, could be a job, could be whatever. It could be anything. And you're only thinking about that circumstance that changed for the, the negative. And if you only focus on that, it's not going to go well for you. It's going to lead to negative things, despair, and as the Bible says, sorrow of the world that worketh 
death. And at that point, when you're doing that, you are walking by sight instead of by faith. Now think about this. David's men were only focused on their circumstances. They only could think about the loss of their families. They were walking by sight, not by faith. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 says, walk, For we walk by faith, not by sight. That's what you're supposed to do. Walk by faith, not by sight. Now, if you walk by sight, you're not walking by faith. That is a fact. If you're walking by sight, only and what that means is if you're only living by looking at your present circumstances, and that's all you're thinking about, you're not walking by faith. Faith looks beyond the circ present circumstance, looks beyond the material world, the physical world, to eternity, to spiritual things, and as I said before, it looks to the promises of the Word of God, which are beyond your circumstances. Here's another verse. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 17. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, it's only temporary, your affliction, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we look not at the things which are seen. What? We do not look at the things which are seen, walking by sight, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Okay? So when we walk by faith, we are thinking about the things of eternity. Things which are eternal, eternal life. We're thinking about heaven. We're thinking about God. Think about Jesus Christ. We're thinking about the promises of the Word of God. We're not thinking about the temporary circumstances in this life. And about people, places, and things, and money, and material possessions. No. We're not looking at everything that we can see with our eyes. That's not what we're looking at. Okay, we need to see and we need to see and remember that those things are just temporary. Everything in this life is temporary. It's all going to fade away one day. Nothing lasts forever. And everything in this world is going to burn. It's going to be gone. One day there will be a new heaven and a new earth. And so it's a dangerous thing to cling onto things that are temporary. It's only going to hurt you. Okay, so walk by faith, not by sight. Walking by sight instead of by faith will hurt you. Not focusing on your present circumstances, getting hyper-focused on that, and that's all you can think about. You got to get off that. Next point, it is important to pray and pour your heart, pour your heart out to God, okay? Now, I'm using these words, specific words for a reason. These are Bible terms. I didn't just say pray. And again, I'm going to impress this especially upon the men who like to suppress emotions, stuff them down until it manifests in bad behavior, negative attitudes, destructive behavior towards themselves and others. You don't want to do that. You need to pray and pour your heart out to God. Pour your heart out. Let me explain. Instead of giving into despair, David encouraged himself in the Lord and this led him to pray to God for guidance. Let's look at this. 1 Samuel chapter 30, verse 7. And David said to Abiathar the priest, Ahimelech's son, I pray. I pray thee, bring me hither the ephod. And Abiathar brought thither the ephod to David. And David inquired at the Lord. He, after all this bad stuff happened, and everyone is having a negative attitude and blaming him. It says he encouraged himself in the Lord. And then he said, time to pray. I'm going to ask God. And he prayed to God. He inquired at the Lord, saying, Shall I pursue after this troop? Shall I overtake them? And he answered him, Pursue, for thou shalt surely overtake them, and wilt thou fail, recover all. Okay, so he prayed to God. Now I'm going to go further with this. Don't hold your emotions in. 
that will only hurt you. Pour it all out to God in prayer. Let's look at some verses here. Psalm 62, verse 8. Trust in him at all times, ye people. Pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. Let's look at another one. Got another one for you. Lamentations chapter 2, verse 19. Lamentations, right? This is a time of mourning. Lamentation. Arise. Cry out in the night, in the beginning of the watches. Pour out thine heart like water before the face of the Lord. Lift up thy hands toward him for the life of thy young children that faint for hunger in the top of every street. Okay? So you got more than one verse that says, Pour out your heart before God. What that means is, you go in private to your prayer closet, whatever it is in the middle of the woods, get in private, and you let it all out to God. All the pain, everything you feel, you got to let it all out to God. It's okay if you're upset. It's okay if you're in pain. You got to tell God. And let me tell you, you will feel more relief after that than anything else. You're killing yourself by stuffing it down. Killing yourself. And the longer you wait, the more it's just going to hurt you and drag you down and everyone else around you. And that brings me to the next danger of this. One of the most important reasons to do this is to avoid bitterness. Bitterness. After loss, people can bottle things up and become bitter. Instead, you need to pour out your heart. Pour your heart out to God and specifically pray that you would not become bitter. The Bible says, Hebrews 12, 15, Lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. Because when you become bitter, when you let a root of bitterness spring up and you become bitter, you also defile everyone around you when you're bitter. You hurt everyone else. You affect everyone else. So, that's one of the biggest reasons you need to pour out your heart to God after a loss so that you don't become bitter and destroy yourself and destroy everyone else around you. This is a warning. You have right here before you the solution. You, right, you have right here the guidance to show you how to avoid doing this negative thing that has hurt so many people if you would just pour it out to God pour out your heart to God it would avoid a lot of pain so make sure that you do that take time to do that next point it is not good to try and deal with the grief in your own strength another thing you know, very, it's very related to what we just said. If you try to deal with loss in your own strength without God's help, you will fail. John 15, 5, Jesus said, I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him. The same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, ye can do nothing. Nothing. Including dealing with loss, devastating loss, negative circumstances you cannot do it in your own strength without Jesus Christ you cannot do it without God you will fail Philippians chapter 3 verse 3 says for we are this circumcision which worship God in the spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh you should have no confidence in the flesh your power, your strength, your ability to handle circumstances like this. You can't. Oh, you think you're so tough and you're so strong. You're not. You will fail in your own strength without God. 
you're not strong enough to deal with it. And so don't try to handle it in your own strength without God. Here's another one. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 8. For we would not, brethren, have you ignorant of our trouble which came to us in Asia, that we were pressed out of measure above strength in so much that we despaired even of life. But we had the sentence of death in ourselves that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God, which raiseth the dead, who delivered us from so great a death and doth deliver, in whom we trust that he will yet deliver us. Okay, so it says they were going through all this trouble. But what, what, did, what did he also say? That we should not trust in ourselves, but in God. And that's what helps them to get through it. Instead of trusting in themselves, trusting in God. Not having confidence in the flesh. Knowing that without Christ you can do nothing. And when you put all that together... It's going to help you to see that you can do nothing without God. You can't do it on your own strength. You need God, which means pray to him, pour out your heart unto him. One more thing to consider. Sometimes very tough trials happen right before a big blessing, which helps us to appreciate the blessing more, not to be complacent, and not to get lifted up with pride. Um, this doesn't always happen, but definitely is something that God does is that right before a big blessing there's something negative that happens like I said so you appreciate it you're not complacent and you don't get lifted up with pride when you have all these blessings and say and just you know act like nothing bad's ever going to happen and you just you're too complacent settling on your lees sitting at ease in Zion and not uh, appreciating things you're taking things for granted you're not depending on God every day praying to God every day, reading the word of God because you got everything you need, right? It talks about, the Bible talks about um, lest you, you be full and forget God. You got everything you need so you forget God, don't need God. Well, that's in order to fight against that God. Um, to counter that, sometimes he has negative things happen before blessings. Right after the devastating loss, David and his men recovered everything. 1 Samuel chapter 30, verse 18, And David recovered all that the Amalekites had carried away. And David rescued his two wives. And there was nothing lacking to them, neither small nor great, neither sons nor daughters, neither spoil nor anything that they had taken to them. David recovered all. That's right. That's what happened. They got everything back. And so you think that you learned some lessons and, and they appreciated things more after that? Yes, they did. So they had the blessing after that. But before they went and recovered all, they didn't just go and try to find them and beat the Amalekites. David first looked to God. He prayed to God. He didn't try to do it out of anger out of his emotions, out of his own strength. He said, you know what? Bring me the ephod. I got to ask God, should I go? He was seeking the will of God. And that's what we should do. Not try to do it in our own strength, our own wisdom, thinking we got it all figured out. Seek the will of God. Ask God, pray to God, depend on him. Okay, so that this is a, that's another point, and also you can see the same you can say the same thing about Job. He went through all that that loss, but then in the end, he had twice as much as he had before, and I'm sure he appreciated that very much. So this is something that happens more than one time, and this was also right before David was was made king, right? So he had to go through all these trials to prepare him for those things, to appreciate and to prepare him spiritually and to strengthen his faith for greater responsibility as well. So there's a lot of reasons, a lot of lessons you can get from these trials, from the, to the losses. And that's why, again, like I said earlier, 
make sure that you are seeing what lessons you can learn from the, this time that you're in the house of mourning. It's a time to get some wisdom. Okay, and so to end the teaching, I'm going to talk about how to respond when other people experience loss, what you can do. So maybe it didn't happen to you. Maybe something bad happened to someone else. And uh, it's, it's just a few points about that. So first of all, you should pray for them. First Samuel chapter 12, verse 23 says, Moreover, as for me, God forbid that I should sin against the Lord in ceasing to pray for you. Okay, this is intercession, praying for someone else. And uh, Samuel said, God forbid I should sin against the Lord in, in ceasing to pray for you, in stopping prayer for you, for other people. Okay, so that's the number one thing when you hear about some someone went through something is to just pray for them okay and that's the most important thing you got to in you if you have been reading and studying the word of god you have faith and so that will help you to see the importance of prayer it is very important to pray for other people and it does help okay and pray for God to help them and be with them and give them grace and comfort through this time. And you could also pray maybe that they should, um, that they would think about their circumstances and maybe get some, learn any lessons that they need to learn as well. It's okay to pray for that as well. And you could even pray for that for lost people too. That's something that I pray. When you hear about, um, a lost person and they go through something bad they have a loss it's okay to you know to pray for them and say hey sorry for your loss whatever it is don't beat them over the head but one thing you can pray for them is that they in that time would think about their own soul that the circumstance would cause them to think about the things of eternity and make them turn to God so that's good to pray as well but for the saints, for the households of faith, pray for them, comfort and grace and these types of things. Make sure you pray for them and weep with them that weep. Sympathize. Romans chapter 12, verse 15 says, Rejoice with them that do rejoice and weep with them that weep. Another one is Hebrews chapter 13, verse 3, which says, Remember them that are in bonds as bound with them. People that are uh, in prison them which and them which suffer adversity as being yourselves also in the body. We suffer adversity. They suffer adversity. Remember those that are suffering adversity. Remember them. Put yourself in their shoes. Like, man, what would it be like to be going through that right now? That's a good thing to think about. Have some, some sympathy, compassion. Even if you've never experienced anything like that in your life, think about, man, what would it be like to be going through what they're going through right now? Weep with them that weep. Remember that. And that should help you also in praying for them. And then offering condolences, obviously. Offer condolences, any help, but also give people space and time. Do not intrude and bother someone grieving who wants to be left alone for a time. That's an important lesson which I'm going to end with. The Bible says in Proverbs 25 verse 17, Withdraw thy foot from thy neighbor's house lest he be weary of thee and so hate thee. Sorry, but this is an important lesson that you got to learn. Okay? Sometimes everybody's different, okay? Everybody's different. You know, we got some people who like to have people around, some people who don't at all. They just want to be left alone completely. And you got to respect that. So, you know, don't be too intrusive you can say, you offer your condolences, praying for you, say, I'm praying for you, whatever it is, but don't be, impose your presence on someone and keep, and, and nag them, bother them, keep trying to contact them. When they're ready, they'll contact you again, they'll start talking again, they'll, you know, they'll come out of their, their house and whatever. Okay? Just please respect people with that. And like I said, some people more than others. Some people like to just be completely left alone. And don't think anything, also don't think anything bad about that person. Okay? You don't know what their life has been like. You don't know what they've been through. 
Um, don't think negatively about someone if they just don't want to talk to anyone and they just want to be left alone. Nothing wrong with that. And just and let them uh, go through their time of mourning. Keep praying for them. And, you know, you have the door open that you're, you're offering help, but you don't want to push it. Okay? So that's pretty much it. Just respect and, and respect boundaries, right? Okay, so um, that's pretty much it. So... Um, just to wrap this up, to close this, if you have gone through a devastating loss, I hope that you would think about all these points that were made in this teaching. Hope that you would consider them and apply them to your life and whatever you're going through right now. Maybe you haven't gone through something yet, but this I pray that you would get these down and remember them for when something like that may happen. And also that you would take some of these lessons and remember them for helping other people as well that may be going through some tough times. And one other thing is that maybe you've gone through something in the past, but you didn't deal with it. Like I said, you maybe you stuffed things down and you haven't poured out your heart into God about it. Maybe you should now. Maybe you should go get alone with God. Maybe if you can't, if you can't get away anywhere, go inside your car and pour out your heart to God. You'll feel a lot better. You will absolutely feel a lot better if you do that. And uh, lay all your burdens at God's feet. Cast thy burden upon the Lord, and He shall sustain thee. The Bible says. Okay, cast your burdens upon Him. Bible also says we should bear each other's burdens. So let's do that as well, respectfully and praying. Okay? So that's pretty much it. Um, hope that was helpful to you. Please uh, like, share, subscribe, check the alternative links. Especially, please sign up for the Telegram feed. That's where you're going to get everything all the updates, all the links, other types of things I'll share there, bonus stuff. Uh, it's going to be in the Telegram feed, and, and that's where you'll be able to contact people if something ever happens on here. Thank you for all the support and all the prayers. God bless you. Have a good day.